Hi everyone, my name is Jack and this is Alistair. And, uh, today we're going to be giving you a little talk about some of our advice for third year students. Yeah, this is a talk we delivered to our research group a couple of weeks ago and we were kindly asked by our uh, supervisor to re-record it and deliver it to you guys because she thinks that it's uh, it could be beneficial to you. So hopefully you can get something of interest from this. So um, just before we start on the tips, we'll just give you a bit of our background and who we are. So my name's Alice Topping. I graduated from Liverpool last year with a 2-1 in pharmacology. And I did two honours projects in my final year. I did FAR 660. Um, I did a dissertation on the activation of T cells by drugs. And then I did a wet project in labs on the NRF2 antioxidant pathway. Um, currently, I'm working on my master's degree, um, which we'll mention later. And I'm looking at PhD opportunities for next year. Um, in my personal life, I'm I was the president of the Musical Theatre Society last year, and I'm also a part-time chef to put me through university. So my name is Jack Roberts, guys. I graduated from the University of Wolverhampton uh, this year with a first class degree in biochemistry. Uh, my research focus at Wolverhampton was trafficking in aquaporins, um, and this basically used mutagenesis to assess which uh, amino acid residues are essential for aquaporin translocation. Yeah, that for me was really interesting, um, but in terms, it seemed quite limited in terms of application to other areas. So that's why I've chosen something different for my master's. Uh, I'm currently doing my master's and then I'd like to start a PhD study. Um, outside of uh, academics, I'm a very keen rugby player. I enjoy going to the gym. And as a hobby, I also have a podcast called The Bloke Box. If you want to have a little look on Instagram, I really appreciate that. It is quite good. I, I do recommend. Thank you, so kind. So we're both in the same research group. We're both working with Professor Leanne um, within the Structural Biology and NMR Centre. And our focus is, uh, if Jack would like to go through that. Yeah, our focus is cytophilin D and its interactions with other proteins in the mitochondria. I'll still give you the background on that because he loves it. <laughs> so uh, cytophilin D is a uh, protein within the mitochondrial um, mitochondrial uh, inner membrane that um, can activate this pore called the MPTP, which can cause, um, it can effectively cause mitochondrial death through swelling and through efflux of solutes. And we are currently looking at it, we're trying to understand it so that it can potentially use it as a drug target um, because mitochondrial dysfunction and bioenergetic dysregulation is a key milestone it's definitely a lot of chronic diseases such as cancer and neurological diseases so we are trying to consider whether or not um, this protein has any potential therapeutic roles whether we can upregulate, downregulate, or we can inhibit or if we can uh, modify to potentially alleviate some of these conditions i'm sure it's quite clear that obviously with mitochondria being so abundant you know, it's so relevant to a lot of a lot of diseases, so it's a huge application there. Definitely. So um, we've got a list of about 10 different factors and traits that we think are really essential for third year study. And these are just things that we wish we'd been told when we started third year, things that we wish we'd have appreciated and picked up on. And I think the biggest one personally, and I think at this moment in time, especially is motivation. It is so difficult nowadays to actually keep yourself going, um, especially this sort of time of year. It's the middle of November or whenever you're listening to this for us now, it's the middle of November, it's the 26th. Um, it's dark outside, it's cold. You don't want to get up in the morning because it's dark. You don't want to go to your desk and work because you've been sat there for the last three weeks just watching Zooms and you've been doing your work on there. And it's so easy to do anything else but your work, but it's the only thing that you can do right now. It's the only thing that's going to get you the degree in the end. It's the only thing that you're paying the 27 grand and everything else for. You need to have a little bit of motivation and a little bit of can do to get yourself where you need to be. 
this isn't just a problem for students. This this is a skill for life. If you can motivate yourself and find that energy to do that, that little thing you've been putting off, then actually that, that goes forward into working life, into your personal life, everything possible. And it's, there's a traditional sort of concept, sort of our own concept we have in our head about motivation. And, you know, it, it, it looks, it's there on the screen in front of you, it says, you know, emotional inspiration leads to motivation, which leads to desirable action. And that, essentially what that means is that you have to want to do something. By wanting to do something, you'll get the motivation to do that. Then you'll start doing that that action you need to do. Um, but there's a, there's a book by uh, Mark Manson called The Subtle Art, and it's he it talks about this idea of um, this loop, this motivation loop. So actually, rather than that linear pathway, uh, you can jump in at any point. So the simple simple fact of just doing something will give you the motivation and then the inspiration, you know, and you can jump in at any pathway. And this, this sort of leads to another concept he talks about quite a lot called the just do something concept which is obviously named very well it talks it gives an idea of if you are the perfect example being your lit review you know i, I believe that's two thousand words you're gonna have to do on on your your on your background area and if you do 200 words of that a day that's done in 10 days and some and just by doing 200 words some days you'll do many more some days you'll just hit that bare minimum of 200 but it'll, it'll be done within 10 days or less because you've stuck to that. And you find yourself doing the reading, doing everything else you need to do with that because you've got that push. You're pushing yourself to just get that done. And um, there's, there's another really interesting theory that I suggest everyone looks at. And uh, it's called the, the self-determination theory. Uh, it's, a, it's a psychological principle, but basically it weighs up internal and external motivation. So, a prime example is, are Alistair and I going to pass our masters just because our parents want us to? Probably not, no, because it's we have, we have to want to do it ourselves. It has to be an internal motivation. So if we are doing this masters because we want to increase our chances of getting the best PhD possible, uh, because we really want a career in our areas, then actually that's an internal motivation. You no, know, we're going to go for it. But if it's just like you know just to plaster it all over instagram probably we're not going to do particularly well at that so that's a really interesting concept there anything to add there Arthur? no i think you've hit the nail on the head though yeah just get up and do something just it's, it goes to a principle that we're going to talk about earlier early a bit later on about resilience just get up and just get something done and it's hard and it is terrible but you're just gonna have to do it yeah. hand in hand with motivation is routine routine for me is making it the most easier to motivate myself basically a thing with routine is it takes a lot of your options away if you get up at this time every day then you don't have to think about what time you're getting up tomorrow okay if you if you know you have dinner or you start preparing dinner at six o'clock and you eat around seven-ish, then there's no more decisions. You, you're working up until six, that kind of thing. Um, and that, that limits your general stress, your anxiety, because you're not having to think about everything. But even, it doesn't have to be as structured as that. Even a loose routine is better than no routine. Um, you know, a, a, the current climate we're in makes it so easy to just watch a lecture in bed but you're probably not going to be making notes if you're in your bed, do you know what I mean? And you sat at your desk, you sat at a desk or a table, notebook in front of you, making notes. And if you're not making notes, you're not really listening, I find, anyway. Um, and the interesting thing about routine is, as humans, we adore structure. We might not think we do. We like to moan about it and complain. But, you know, we love structure. Uh, and without it, it actually leads to a sort of chaos in our own head. Um, you know, with a routine comes all comes the opportunity to tick all those boxes. Uh, you know, you need you have time to exercise, time to relax, time to cook, time to bake, time to socialize, uh, and then time to relax, and most importantly, time to sleep. I cannot stress how important sleep is. Um, lovely book called Why We Sleep. Can't remember the author, but that's very interesting. 
Um, and it's important you have a routine for yourself. It, it's completely trial and error to find out what gets the best out of you. Um, you know, but routines allow planning and they allow productivity and that breeds positivity. Uh, positivity is cringy as that is. Yeah, definitely. I think you've hit the nail on the, on the head there, Jack. That's perfect. And I think going hand in hand with routine as well as the idea of organisation, but more of a personal organisation, sort of like a, rather than an intrinsic, more of an extrinsic. So if you look around now, is your desk as clear as it can be? Do you want to work there? Like I, when I, uh, last week I spent a full week just doing R coding and I had plates lined up everywhere because I was eating my dinner at my desk. I had glasses, I had mugs, clothes strewn about the floor. And by Thursday or Friday, I did not want to be sat at my desk because it was so horrible and it was so grim and I had to move stuff about to actually get to my desk and start to work that I was like, you know what? I actually can't be bothered to sit and do it today because I've I've woken up, I've got on myself ready and I've looked at my desk and I've been like, it, nah, that, that just doesn't appeal to me. So at the end of every day, take all your plates and all your dishes through to the kitchen, get them cleaned. Organise your notes at the end of every day. It's a great way to wind down. It's a great way to get yourself focused for the day ahead, coming tomorrow. Just keep everything as, as, as clutter-free as possible because it's less things to distract you as well. If you've got your phone on your desk, you're more likely to look at your phone than if your phone's plugged in on the wall. Add it to that as well. Have a place to work, whether that's at your desk, whether that's in the library, whether that's at your kitchen table, wherever. Just have somewhere that is your space for however long it needs to be that you can do work. Jack mentioned it before, but working in your bed is a terrible idea because you just want to go back to sleep. I've done it before. I've gone to, I've, I've zoomed in seminars from bed and I've fallen back asleep or I've not listened properly or I've just had it on in the background while I've gone and made a cup of coffee. If you sit down somewhere and you focus completely, you're more likely to actually get something from that activity than you if you do it in the background. Um, also, Jack mentioned with routine, make sure your day is the best it can be for um, organised uh, sort of what you're planning on doing. Definitely have a bit of wiggle room, have a room, have a bit of time for, okay, well, uh, I'm not so hungry now, so I can have dinner in an hour's time rather than now, but that means I'm going to knock off work an hour early, I'm going to have this hour for myself. Just play about with your time a bit better have a loose structure to your day and just play around with the idea, leave room for socialising, leave room for exercising and leave room for yourself to have fun, but make sure you get the stuff that you need to get done, done that day. Um, as well, myself, myself and Jack mentioned this before we went on to the talk, but get dressed in the morning, it's essential. It's the first thing you do, it's like, it's like making your bed. If you can accomplish something with your first task of the day, you're gonna feel so much more motivated to get stuff done than if you get into your pyjamas, you stay in your pyjamas or if you get into tracksuit bottoms. Because I know it's personally that when I get into tracksuit bottoms, the day just sort of goes, doesn't happen. But if I get up and I put a proper shirt on and I put some jeans on and socks as well, it sounds weird, but when you sit down at your desk, you're more motivated to do work because you've accomplished something. I just add to that, mate, just quickly. Yeah, sure. If you make your bed before you get a shower, you're not going to get back into it because you come back exactly. into it and go, I'm not going to get back into that. That's yeah. just something that I've learned through trial and error, and, and that's how I roll now. Yeah, you don't want to mess your bed up, exactly. Um, as well, I noticed this last year, plan out all your academic work. Um, even if it's just a loose plan of all the points you want to hit, if you get set a question, it's 500 words. And you know I need to answer this question by talking about if you're a geneticist and you need to talk about these SNPs and these polymorphisms, if you're a pharmacologist, you need to talk about these drugs, if you're a biochemist, you need to talk about these pores, just write down a piece of paper so you know that when you're answering them in the question, you need to hit these points. Not only does it mean that you won't forget about them, it also structures, very, very loosely structures your answer because you know that you have to hit these points when you're answering the question. Finally, last point, because I know I'm laboring this whole organisation a little bit. A lot of people don't like to work in silence and that's completely understandable. Silence is not natural. If you don't like to work in silence, try and choose music that's not going to distract you. Don't pick something from the top 40. Don't pick a podcast. 
don't pick anything that you want to listen to. Pick something like classical music. Classic FM is such a trope for students when you say, what have you been listening to to get your study done? Classic FM, film soundtracks. A lot of people nowadays talk about video game soundtracks like uh, Coconut Mall from Mario Kart because video game soundtracks induce a sense of uh, wonder and anxiety within the player to get the level done. So if you don't like working in a completely sterile silent environment, choose music that you don't want to sing along to, you don't want to get up and dance to. Just try and limit your distractions as much as you can. Absolutely. Um, little, tying into that, sorry, tr tying into that as well, procrastination is so easy to procrastinate nowadays, even before coronavirus. Like, just having your phone on you means you're more likely to go on your phone. If you've got games on your laptop, you're more likely to go on your games. I've got Steam downloads and the amount of pings I get from my friends saying, do you want to get onto this game? It's like, well, I do, but I want to work right now. So easy to just not do your work and put it off and you get this horrible sense of anxiety through not working because you're like, I really should be working. You get guilt complex and it's just horrible. So I think the best way to deal with that is to actually have a work ritual. So... This app that you can see in the top corner, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but it's just up here. It's called Forest, uh, and it's on the App Store. It's for Android, and it's for Apple, uh, iOS, um, and it's effectively a fancy timer, and you put in however much time you want to concentrate for, half an hour, 45 minutes, a full hour. You put your phone on, and then it does not let you go into any other app apart from Forest when you open up your phone. So you can't answer any text, you can't look at Snapchat, you can't look at Instagram, you can't watch YouTube. You have to keep on that app, and it means that you're not going to answer the text because it's just come through. You're going to try as hard as you can to stick to that half an hour. And as the half an hour goes on, you grow a little tree, and if you go off the app within that half an hour, your tree wears and dies. So it's a good way of structuring your time. If you know I need to concentrate for six hours a day to get all my work done, get the app, get Forest or get whatever app you fancy. I'm sure there's a few others nowadays, and plug it in, sit yourself down and get your work done uh, because it's such an easy way to just get half an hour of solid work done. And it might not feel an actual point that you stop at. You might be like, oh, half an hour. So you might go a little bit longer. You, it's just a good way to get yourself to start working. And the beauty, the beauty of this app for me, because I, Alice told me about it, I tried it out, and um, mm. the time was on the screen. So, you know, you get a text, just hear your phone go off. You've done 25 minutes, so you just go, oh, I'll just look at that in, in five minutes' time. It's counting down, counting down to make a look at that message. And that, that for me, is really useful. Um, yeah. I'm sure it'll be for a lot of you, too. Yeah, it's like a little reward. At the end of the day, you're like, you look back at your forest and you're like, oh, that's done brilliant today. I've grown eight trees. And it's like, it sounds really daft, but until you try it. Yeah, honestly, you just, that, if you take take one thing from this talk, try the app. Try the app. Love it. We're not being Probably sponsored by it. We're not being sponsored. We wish we were. <laughs> 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 no, but seriously, do try this app, and I've got to credit my girlfriend for telling me about it. Um, as well, scheduling your time out so you don't get bored. There's no point in saying I'm going to do a full set of, if you're doing pharmacology, I'm going to study all the pharmacodynamics today, all the pharmacokinetics. I'm going to do all GI drugs today because that's just nebulous. That's just, okay, so I'm going to do this set of eight lectures today. Well, are you really? Schedule out your time so you don't get bored. I'm going to do these two lectures in the morning, then read up on these notes, and then I'm going to do this question in the afternoon, and then I'm going to knock off the day. It means that as well as having a broad idea of what you're going to do the day, you're also able to schedule out your time. You're able to say to your friends, well, after I've got this essay question done, I can go through to the kitchen and we can have a bit of time. You know, um, once I've done this lecture, I can go through and make a cup of tea. It's that idea of, if you have a brought it, Jack mentioned it earlier, brilliant. Like if you've got an idea of how the day you how you want the day to go, the day will go so much more smoothly. Trust me. As well to that, don't be afraid to have a day off. Mental health is so important as well. If you feel like you're just being too, uh, you've got too much on, like it's all coming at once. Just have a morning off, have an afternoon off. Just do something you like doing, but make sure you plan around this. Make sure that you know, okay because I've gone on a big walk this afternoon and I've not done any work, tomorrow I'm going to have to do this, this and this. Just have a good, like, sorry, John. So don't, don't use 
the things you love as escapism. Don't don't block out the other things you need to do, but actually, yeah. you know, consider your week as different sections and actually you do need a day off. I know I probably struggle more due to lockdown having days off because I'm not leaving the house, so I always feel guilty not doing work. But if you schedule that into your life and say, actually, so typically this weekend the rugby's on, I'm going to probably be out of action Saturday, I'm going to watch that all day. But then Sunday, back to work, back to the back to the grind. Definitely. We've got to work like that. You can't just run away from your problems. Yeah. And I think as well, when you guys have got dissertations, you've got literature reviews as well to write. If you keep putting them off because you've just got a deadline at the end of January and you keep saying, oh, well, I'll get it sorted at some point because you want to do all this other stuff, you're going to get two weeks before and you're going to be you're going to be like, oh my God, I should have done work earlier. And Jack said it perfectly. Make sure you know, balance play time and fun and work time. It's as simple as that. Just make sure that you know what you're doing with your time. And at the end of our talk, we actually, I actually asked our supervisor, um, does she still suffer with procrastination? And she gave quite an insightful answer actually, which is actually the answer I wanted to hear. She mm. does, yeah. So you don't go out of it. It's something you're going to have to battle with for the rest of your life. But she said often she finds that if she's procrastinating, the task is either, number one, pointless, she doesn't want to do it, or it's just something that doesn't interest her. And it's diff difficult for us because there's a lot of tasks that we get given that don't interest us. Mm. We, have to, we have to find something in it that does interest you. Um, to, you know, you've got to just try to find something that's going to make you want to do it. So if it's the next thing, so if you're doing a referencing task, for example, and then soon you're going to be, it's going to make referencing your longer essays much easier because you've done a referencing task. You have to look at things like that, even though you don't want to do them. Sometimes it's just needs must. It's just delaying gratification, which we'll talk about in a bit, little bit anyway. It's just the idea of putting stuff off that you need to do, um, and doing stuff now that you don't really want to do so it would be beneficial in the future. Okay, expectation. You need to be real with your own expectations, but don't undersell yourself at all. So it's important for you to know what to expect of yourself. So if you have been getting just 40% in all of your modules, and you're still fixated on getting a first, at this stage, you're probably not gonna. And you have to be real with that expectation. You have to sort of say to yourself, I'm gonna do as best as I can, but this is where I'm at. And sometimes, sometimes being honest to yourself is one of the hardest things you can do, but it's really important. Um, you know, you have to look at what you wanna get out of your third year project and third year in general. Do you want to be the best research scientist you can be so you can walk onto a PhD or, or a, a, an MRES like we're doing? Or do you just want to get it done with? And that equivalates a different amount of effort you put into things. Um, and I'll ask you if you want to add to that and I'll talk about Yeah, it definitely. Well. Like, um, if you just want to get out of university and you just want to get onto some nice grad scheme, that's fine, that's brilliant, but you still have to work for it but you need to have that final goal at the end. If you want to get onto a PhD, you need to have that final goal at the end. You need to have a good idea now, not a brilliant idea. You can have a good play about what you want to do. Okay, do I want to carry on in, in education? Do I want to do a postgraduate qualification? Do I just want to get a job? Do I want to do some volunteering for 12 months? Do I want to take a gap here at the end of this? Just have an idea of what you want to do at the end of third year and through this project and just be like, right, well, to achieve that, I'm going to have to do this. Um, you're just going to have to, um, just going to have to deal with it, unfortunately. Importantly, um, in this, so expectations, other people have expectations of you. So definitely. the prime example at the moment is uh, you want to do online lectures or your seminars. I think going in, a lot, a lot of professors would, or, or um, supervisor, or lecturers would probably sure, yeah. have an expectation for you to get involved and answer their questions. And from our own knowledge, there's a significant amount of silence when someone asks a question. And actually, you just got to put your hand up and, and maybe set an example to other people and just give an answer. Because that 
sticks in that in that person's mind. So if you're going to your supervisor with questions, when they come to write your reference, we're going to have more to talk about. And we've got a little bit about that later on. Um, but other people have expectations of you. And it, it's, it's, you don't want to disappoint them at all. Yeah. Equally, other people's expectations should be realistic of you. So mm. no one expects you to be, be going to their research group and be the most perfect research student ever because it's not going to happen. Alistair and I are a completely different field to, to where we've ever researched before. And our supervisor does not expect us to know everything. Sometimes she's disappointed when we don't, granted, mm. but she doesn't expect it. And that's really important. Yeah. Just, uh, just be aware that people have preconceived notions and people do expect things of you. And sometimes they might not be great. Sometimes they'll be brilliant and you're just going to have to deal with it because it's just a fact of life. And Jack mentioned it perfectly. Every situation that you'll find yourself in in third year and the rest of your life, people will have expectations of you. And they might not be vocalised. People might not say, okay, I was really disappointed that you said that or I was really disappointed that you didn't know that. But you need to raise yourself to them rather than expect them to lower to you or vice versa. Um, you need to work on, I won't say work on actually, um, you need to be aware that people do expect things from you. Definitely. Absolutely. Attitude is essential. It is the only skill that no one teaches you that they really, really should. It's massively linked to your work ethic and Attitude and work ethic are the two main factors in productivity. Um, if you go into a room with good energy, that's infectious. Okay. Um, you know, if you're doing a task with someone and you you have a good chat beforehand, the likelihood of you working harder is so much more because you're already cohesive. You're already working together. Um, so Alistair and I write in this presentation. We probably had about 30 minutes of productive talk in about two and a half hours. But those 30 minutes were so productive because we were already we were already working for one another yeah. just through having a good chat. And just getting and, to know each other. Yeah, and taking little breaks and then it's so important because you actually you get to know different sides of people. And when, and when you know different sides of people, you know people's strengths, you know their weaknesses. And that is just so important. You do not have to love everything you do. You just have to find something in it that you can that you love. So the prime example for us right now is we are spending hours of our lives on our try, and I'd never seen it before. I'd never used it before October. Um, so it was daunting for me. Uh, I procrastinated a lot. I put it off, and then suddenly I start to get to grips with it, and I'm spending you know probably hours getting code wrong, and then eventually a graph pops up in the bottom right hand corner. And you're like, yeah, and every time those graphs pop up, that's the bit I like about it. So I just keep going for it. And, you know, when I was reading a book last night, it's called Zero Negativity by Ant Milton. And um, he talks about this idea of positivity. And it, like, it has the, the possibility to essentially to bulletproof you through life. Because if you are constantly walking around with this, this aura and you're constantly putting this onto other people, less negative things come your way because your positivity outweighs them. And that, to me, is something really worth thinking about and it's really interesting. Yeah, brilliant. I don't think I can add anything to that, but, yeah, you just hit the nail on the head there, Jack. I'm very passionate about it, mate. Mm, definitely. Um, this is essential. Just the interactions you have, and it, it links back to the expectations people have of you. The interactions you'll have within your research team for your honours project and within your cohort for the year and with all your friends are going to be essential, not only for the year, but for the rest of your life. Treat your role in the research team as a job. You might just be sitting in front of a load of code now because you're doing bioinformatics and being like, I feel like a loose cog, but you will be appreciated and you need to do your job and your job is so essential to the running of an actual research team. You might not feel like you're on a research team right now, but well, trust me, you are. You should support each other as much as you are being supported. Speak to, if you're in contact with master students, PhD students, postdoctoral 
um, uh, researchers. Talk to them, be interested, be interested in what they have to say. Allow yourself to be mentored, but also mentor the people perhaps in your year. Perhaps if you're a, um, if you've got a lab partner or two, talk to them about it. Last year when I was in my honours project, I had a lab partner and she was a medic, intercollective medic. She didn't know how to prepare uh, as well as I did. And she didn't know any statistics. So I spent some time, got to my head around statistics, statistics myself and then helped her through the statistics part of the research. Um, that reinforces your own knowledge as well when you're mentoring Definitely. people. It hones your own skills that you already have. It makes them better. Yeah. Um, you have to be, I, I, this, this goes with expectations, but you have to be aware of the standards others have set and actually raise yourself to them because a established research group is not going to lower its standards for you. Hmm. But if you if you get yourself up to the bar, they'll pull you the rest of the way. And that's yeah. essential. You have to be an interesting person in your life because otherwise people aren't going to be interested in you. You have to show interest in people's lives and they'll show interest in you and that's how it works. So ask these follow-up questions when your supervisor is going through a paper with you, say, ask the questions that come to your head because that allows them to understand where you're at and it also allows them to show to know that you're interested. People around you now, your supervisor, like I've said, will write you reference for the next step of your life. If they don't know who you are, it makes it an incredibly pointless reference. Because it's just because it's to an employer or to a another a, like a head of research yeah, who wants to take you on, they're going to go, "Well, this is generic. I'm not. I'm not interested in generic people." And unfortunately, that's just the world we live in. And you have to raise yourself to those standards. Have I missed anything there, Alistair? Sorry? Have I missed anything there, no? No, I don't think so. Um, just to add on to what you've said there, Jack, um, when I was applying for this Masters the MRES, I needed two references, and both references came from my lab work. One came from my supervisor, like the PI, principal investigator, and the other came from a postdoctoral researcher. And I credit those to getting me onto this course references is so essential to work in general it's it goes back to the old mantra it's not what you know is who you know and if you can have somebody who's really um credited in the field somebody who's really highly respected say i've worked with this student they're really good they know what they're doing just let them do what they need to do and they'll get it done people are more likely to give you the chance you need people are more likely to take you off something even perhaps if um if your grades aren't as good maybe um maybe perhaps you're not as qualified as you need to be maybe it's a completely different line of research that you're moving into a reference can make or break not only an application for a master's or a phd but for a job or anything be really aware that people will be making little judgments about you as long as you are interacting with them as well as that jack connect with people on email connect with people on linkedin talk to people just talk about stuff you've heard on the news this is a golden time now for biological research because there's so much going on rna vaccines and lipid coats um drugs that are being potentially used against covid COVID itself and all the other stuff surrounding it. So many people are so interested in biology at the moment that it's a golden opportunity, especially in the news, to talk to people, be like, go up to your um, research uh, team and say, I saw this in the news. Could you talk to me about potential implications about it? Could you talk to me about what it actually means so that I have a better opportunity when I'm talking to people? Just as Jack said, ask follow up questions and be interesting as a person try your hardest to you don't have to read all these other books under the sun you don't need to go to every single seminar as long as you've got something to say even if it's the most reductive thing reductive 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 thing possible even if you just said i've seen this on bbc news this morning can we talk about it people will be so happy to talk to you about their uh their interpretation of it and as well talk about their research absolutely one more thing to add there we actually 
we had a question from a member of our research group um, when we did this talk. And she said that she was living in a student house and she was struggling to get work done sometimes because everyone wanted to spend time with her. Um, how would we deal with that? And this, this, this goes in, this ties into interactions because it's not just interacting with academics or your peers, it's interacting with your friends. It can be very, very challenging Definitely. in that situation to say to someone, hi, oh, yeah, I do want to spend time with you, but actually I've, I've got to do this essay. That's a really hard conversation to have, but it's so important because otherwise you're going to get distracted for the next few hours. And if you are open, and this goes on to the next, uh, one of the next slides very, very well, if you are open and honest with people, it's like ripping a plaster off. It stings a bit more to start with, but then it goes away really, really fast. Um, yeah. If you just say, you know, I'm going to do this, and I'm going to be in your room, we're going to watch a film, and you tie that into your routine and your day, those, those interactions with people are a lot easier to have than avoiding them or, or succumbing to that peer pressure. Yeah, definitely. Fantastic point, Jack. Integrity is my favourite word, um, and that is because honesty genuinely is the best policy in, in every aspect of your life. Like I just said with that plastic thing, if you rip it off, it stings, it hurts, but it goes away within seconds. This is important in your research group because no one expects you to know everything. It's so normal not to. Um, and if you ask those stupid questions, you might feel silly for two seconds, but it's a damn sight better than um, getting caught out later. Equally, if you if your supervisor asks you to read a paper for a meeting on Friday, and you haven't, say you haven't, because they'll ask a follow-up question, and you'll you lie straight to their face, and they'll know you've lied. They might not tell you they know you've lied, but they know. And then you've got to then earn your trust back with that person and that's a lot harder to do after you've lied to someone than it is by just saying, I haven't read it because I've got this going on, but I promise you I'll read it over the weekend and I'll speak to you by on Monday. Mm. They might be disappointed, but they won't lose faith in you. And once you lose their faith, that's gone. Yeah. Being honest to yourself about your strengths and your weaknesses is one of the hardest things to do because you admit you're admitting flaws and that's that's impossible to do. But it's it's so essential. Um because then you, if you're honest with yourself and you can be honest with people, like classic example, Alison knows my statistical analysis is not flawless whatsoever. But I'm honest with him about that. So when I check through things with him, he's he's watching out for me. And as a part of that himself, because it, it is, you know, our research affects each other's. And that's important. Because if I said, Alison, my stat, it's it's the best you've ever seen. He's probably not going to put much interest into what I'm doing there, and that can affect us both. Yeah. Um, something else there, isn't there? Let's have a seat. Um, just a story from this week. I was speaking to my supervisor, and um, she said, would you like to lead this? Because we have a lab meeting every Friday morning. And she said, would you like to lead the lab meeting this week, perhaps on the stuff you've read? And I said to her, I said, Professor, and it really... I felt I had a sinking feeling in my stomach. I said, Professor, I'm, I, I don't think I know enough about the topic now that what I will say will not be reductive and will not build on what I've already heard from you and from the PhD students. I said, okay, that's fine. Will you be able to do it next week? And I said, next week will be fine. I'll definitely be able to do it the week after. And then I followed up by saying, also, Professor, I've read this in a paper. I don't fully understand it. And I said something and it took about two seconds and she said, yeah, but it's that. People um, really appreciate honesty and will help you if you're honest. Like people are not good liars by and large. <laughs> the vast majority of people cannot lie convincingly. Unless you're psychopath. And, uh, yeah, exactly. Unless you're psychopath. Like you, so many tells and so many just vocal things that implicate you in lying. It's fantastic and fascinating to read and watch. But it's also scary because you want to be able to get away with a lie, but you don't. And it's hard, it's so hard to just sit and say, I haven't done it. Because the vast majority of the time, the person you're telling don't, doesn't care. They might be upset, as Jack said, they might be disappointed. They don't care. 
because they planned that you probably don't know everything just yet or you haven't read this because you've had this on people know that you're busy you've heard your students you've got um your dissertation lab work you've got all your other modules you might be on committees for societies you might have other stuff going on personal stuff they're not going to assume that you're just an automaton that works from seven o'clock in the morning to eight o'clock at night and just yeah, and read they don't, they don't, they don't want that either they want you to they don't want that yeah. um another prime example uh, before we move on is my final year dissertation that i was i was writing um i was quite close to my supervisor but basically my brother lives in, in Brisbane and my whole family was fine out there. And my parents asked if I'd meet them in Bali in, in the February. And I said, like, I really can't because I'm writing the dissertation. Um, and just on the off chance, I was in the lab with him one day. And I just mentioned something. I mentioned it to him and I said, I've got this opportunity to go and meet my family in Bali for two weeks. Um, what do you think? And he said, Jack, you've got to go. You've got to go. Absolutely. You, you'll be able to, you know, you've got... 22 hours each way on a plane, you'd be able to write up as much as you want and then just have two weeks. You didn't need it. And you'd probably find out that if you miss something in those two weeks, the amount the the fact that you've sort of had a bit of R and R, you come back to it, you'll you'll smash the rest of the year. And if I hadn't have mentioned that to him, I would not have gone on that holiday just before lockdown. So, you know, I just think if you're honest with things, then then good things come to you. Definitely. Um, Another just key point I'd like to just make is um, with strengths and weaknesses, we talk continually um, within, throughout academia about critical analysis of papers, experiments, um, research methods, and we hardly ever critically evaluate ourselves. And that's something you really should do. Um, because what's the point in spending hours making your strengths even stronger when your weaknesses are flagging behind? Just something to think about there for you guys, and we'll move on to the next slide. Yeah. So resilience, it's it's quite easy nowadays, and especially in third years, you just go like, all right, I give up. I'm dropping out. This is too hard. I'm just gonna phone this module in. The whole idea of university is delayed gratification. It's the idea that you're foregoing the immediate for the long term. Something might be real, you might get like if you think about it in numbers, say, and it's a really bad way of describing it, but it's the best way I can think of it at the moment. If you do something for the immediate, you might get 10 out of it. If you do something for the long term, you might not get that 10 immediately, but you get 1,000 later on. Mm -hmm. And it's the idea that, oh, I'd go out tonight, but I need to do this reading for this essay. The reading might not seem immediate, but the essay will be immediate soon. And because you've done the reading, you'll be able to do better on the essay, which means you'll do better on the module, which means you'll do better finally in your final exam. And it's just that idea. It might be groomed for the next week, next two weeks, just to do the work and to get stuff done. And you might be really busy with other stuff as well. But it's not going to be like this forever. It's, this, it's the old um, Bible passage, this too will pass. Like There's nothing so terrible that's going to stay forever. And... Myself and Jack have just come out of assessment week. We've just been doing a lot of R coding. I don't particularly like R coding. I don't really understand it. It's, I, like, uh, it's co I don't really code much anyway, and that is new to me. Um, and I felt really, really down because my code wasn't working and I was being assessed on it. And then I submitted it. And as soon as I submitted it, I was like, brilliant. It's done. It's final. I sorted it and I felt so much better because for that week I'd spent so long thinking about it and worrying about it and then I submitted it and even though it might not be completely right, might not be completely perfect, it's a learning experience. So for the next time I do it, I might spend a bit more time looking at parts of code I found difficult and it's all a big learning experience really. Yeah, absolutely. If you just keep grinding away and keep putting one foot in front of the other, eventually you reach the goal but you've got to have the strength to not turn back around or to not stop. So you've got to keep going. Yeah, definitely. And this, this leads on to our next slide, by the way. Definitely. And just one last final point. When I started third year pharmacology, the first interactions we had with everybody else, we got sat in a meeting room with all the other finalists for pharmacology. And Chris Goldring, who's the leader of pharmacology at the time, he's the model organiser, he said, well done for getting to third year, because not everybody does. And I thought to myself, hmm, 
It's a good point because I, I didn't really, I didn't particularly like second year. I, I found it very difficult. Um, and I thought, yeah, it's a good point. Yeah, I'm not going to give up now because I've already made it this far. You well know, over halfway. Well over halfway. You've made it. You've got there. All you need to do is finish the year. If you don't want to go anywhere near university again, ever, fine. Don't leave university. If you hate exams, don't do them. Uh, and you want to stay in academia, don't do an exam in a, uh, uh, an examined course. Do a research degree. Do a, uh, a, doc, uh, a PhD instead of doing an MSc. It will not stay forever, third year. And third year is tough. Trust, we've just been through it. I've still got the emotional baggage from third year. <laughs> it is difficult, but you'll get through it. Trust us. You will. Yeah, will. Um, so I think this is like a good place to stop, really, and, and good place to find it, to bring it whole home. And it's the idea of confidence. And you need to have confidence in yourself. If you don't have confidence in yourself, nobody else will. And it's the idea of faking it till you make it. It's the idea that you might not think that you're good at anything right now. You might not think that, oh, ecology, I'm really terrible at ecology. You might think that, but you don't need to, make, you don't need to show anybody else that you think that. No. If you show people that you are willing to learn and that you come and you're interested and you're um, willing to learn, you're going to get so much out of it. Um, be happy making your mistakes. It's the only way you learn is video game logic again and again and again. You keep failing on the same level over and over and over again until you learn the precise jump or the move that you need to do to win that level. Yeah. And it's that over and over again, you learn your skill set. It's like our code, and myself and Jack have spoken about it at length. You keep making the same mistakes in your code until you, you get um, you do it right. You just put, plug in the right variables. And you get code to pass out of you, and it's the best feeling in the world. And then you never make that mistake again because you know that particular line of code that you've had so much trouble with. Yeah. And you know, you, you, you're air coding away, and you, you've missed a comma about a thousand times, and you put a comma in, and you go, that's it. And you never forget to put a comma in there again. Yeah, definitely. That's how you learn. Um, as well. Um, be happy with, you, with what you do know, with what perhaps what you don't. Um, so I've put up here, I don't know if you guys can see, I'll just move Jack's head down slightly. Um, this is what's called a uh, Dunning-Kruger uh, distribution, and it's an idea in psychology that uh, confidence in a subject varies depending on how much you know. So when people start to learn a subject, the confidence shoots up immediately because they're, they're so excited about this new topic, and then they realize what they don't know, and the confidence drops into the valley of despair. And then the more and more you learn about the topic, the more com your confidence grows. So in third year now, you might just been given your topic and it might be something that you've never really learned about apart from maybe one or two lectures. You might read up on it and it might all be gibberish to you. You might have no idea what it is. And I mean, for myself and Jack, like um, our topic is the mitochondria and we may have not looked at the mitochondria in any sufficient, sufficient detail. And then we got sent to all these papers and all this stuff about um, all these little parts of the mitochondria. And I don't know about Jack, but my confidence dropped slightly because I was like, there's so much I don't know. How well am I going to get something I do know? But it's just, it's the idea of resilience. It's bearing with something to actually get something from it. You will get more confidence in the subject. Slope, isn't it? It's just trying exactly. to climb the slope. Climb the slope. And you will get there in the end. And you will be, you won't be an expert in a topic, but you'll know a damn sight more than a lot of people do in a topic. And you can take that away. And you can take that to the bank. I put Jack's head back. Um, as well, if you feel com if you feel confident and you work close and make confident and you stand with your head high and your shoulders back and you talk nicely and you're not always woe is me despair, people will only see that side of you. People won't think, oh, what's that person hiding on the surface? If you present yourself as a confident, outgoing individual, people are going to be like, okay, yeah, they are. They are. They're not going to question it. And that people are going to be more positive with you and that's going to reinforce your own confidence and self-confidence um as well you've all i said it before as well you made it this far why why would you stop now you've already spent 27 grand uh, that alone just carry on with it you might as well <laughs> like um at the end of the day you're going to leave 
university with a qualification from a Russell Group University in a life science, that is a really, really valuable qualification. And you've proven not only to yourself, but to everybody who doubted you that you've got the... Yeah. And that's such confidence boost. The owner of that. One of the reasons I'm on this course right now is because when I was in um, year 12, my head of sixth form turned around to me and was like, yeah, you shouldn't be doing these subjects. You should be doing something else. And I was doing biology, chemi- I was doing biology chemistry, history and French. And he was like, he actually said, you're too thick for this. Do something else. And I was like, no, I will not let you put me down. I worked so hard and I got to university and I worked throughout my degree got a degree in pharmacology, which is a difficult subject, and now I'm on a master's. And every time I feel self-doubt at myself, I just imagine this face and I'm like, proved you wrong though, didn't I? Yeah, and that's, that's it, mate. It's about finding what really makes you grind. And straight away there, he's giving you internal motivation. Yeah, definitely. See, to me, that's a real thing. Yeah, see, he's not just making it up. Yeah. Uh, right, next slide. Next slide. It's okay, a brief, so brief summary for you guys. Yeah. Um, for us, be a person you want to work with, um, that you would want to work with. You know what I mean? Make sure it's someone you could get on with because other people are trying to do the same thing. Yeah. Uh, as well, just think about how much you you've come already from the first day in first year and reflect on who you are. Um, you're not a complete failure just because you can't do one particular question on one particular module. Um, like you've come so far already. Um, just be realistic with your goals think about what you've come from think about what you've done and you'll feel better for it be honest with yourselves and others guys and stay positive as best you can and you know try and project that positivity onto every situation you're in and the people you're around yeah and finally just keep it in the back of your mind at all time that nobody's going to do it for you you can only do third year for yourself you can have support you can have a great support network but you're going to be the person sat in the exam hall. You're going to be the person who stands up on stage. Hopefully, fingers crossed, in July, accepting your degree from the Chancellor. Yeah. You're going to do it yourself, and it's going to be your achievement. So you need to work for it yourself. Yeah. Uh, so thank you so much for listening to our talk. Um, we've got some contacts here. If you've got any questions at all, anything at all, that's even if it's completely banal and stupid and you think it is please just contact with us also uh, send if, us, sorry yeah, sorry me. also if you've enjoyed the talk you know let us know we'd love to we'd love to hear yeah it. definitely um this, this is a big surprise for us to be doing it and we're dead happy that hopefully this might help you guys a little bit definitely so send us anything what, anything uh, memes send us memes we love memes he does um uh, yeah. and guys Importantly, if you haven't got yourself on, on LinkedIn, get yourself on LinkedIn and definitely connect with us. Um, Jack Roberts, as the top end. Yeah. Thanks for taking uh, time to listen, guys. We really appreciate it. Yeah, we really appreciate you sitting through this talk. And we hope that you've gotten something positive from it. So thank you so much. Thanks. Bye, guys. Cheers. Bye, guys. Thank you.